On the onset of this study, once again, I call your attention to the transdispensational principle highlighted in James chapter 4 and verse 6, where our Lord, or the Word of God says, but He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Notice again, the proud and the humble are contrasted, but also notice how God resists the proud, and He gives grace to the humble. You know that word resist, anti tossel is a military term to mean to resist like an opponent. In contrast, he gives grace. That word didomi, gives, means gives as a gift or as a provision. You see, as a believer, God is for you. He wants what is best for you, but he resists you like the wind does when you spit into it. On the contrary, when you act in humility, God is like the wind at your back, guiding and directing you. The question is, will you respond to him in pride, or will you walk in humility? And I say this because carnal believers lose sight of this. You know, they fight the will of God, they resist the will of God, they're hell-bent and doing it own, their own way, they operate out of pride, God resists them, and even at times believers may rebuke them, and then they think that God is ungracious, or believers are ungracious, when in reality they have the problem. They're acting in pride instead of humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, if James 4, 6 is true, it's safe to assume that you and I want to be, yea, we need to be among the humble. But how? How can we have a proper perspective of ourselves? How can we respond and walk in humility instead of pride or arrogance? Well, we've observed from the scriptures thus far that humility requires that we gain a growing and high perspective on God such as his greatness and his grace and loyal love. And indeed, God is gracious and God is great. Furthermore, in fact, when compared to God instead of to man, we are totally insufficient and we are totally insignificant and we are humble. God is great in his goodness, always. God is great in his faithfulness, always. God is great in his holiness, always. He is worthy of your trust. He is worthy of your worship. He is worthy of your devotion, always. But secondly, we know that humility requires a growing orientation to God's grace. His unmerited, undeserved kindness, in which he offers us blessing, when in reality we deserve the opposite. And let me underscore the word growing. Because it doesn't come all at once. It is a process. And also let me hi highlight the word orientation. This deals with your perspective on how you view things. How you view God. How you view yourself. How you view others. And since we do not naturally understand God's grace, and since we are naturally prone to pride, we need a growing orientation to God's grace. <coughs> to live in greater and greater humility. And that is why I'm so grateful tonight to have a copy of the Word of God. It's called in Acts 20.32, the Word of His Grace. For you see, Isaiah makes it clear, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there but water the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word, God says, be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And indeed, as we think of his thoughts and his ways being higher than ours, that's the way of grace. You see, we don't naturally think grace. This was true with salvation. 
You see, naturally we think, well, Jesus Christ did his part, but we must do ours. And again, this is salvation by works. The truth of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again to provide salvation for us, full and free forever, and he did 100% of the work. And that is why, again, he cried out on the cross, it is finished. And that is why you do nothing to be saved, simply putting your faith in the one who did it all for you. And so requ humility requires a growing orientation to God's grace, starting with salvation. Starting with embracing the message of the gospel of grace. And how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that's why last Sunday we concentrated on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not of, by works, so that no one can boast. You see, dear friends, pride is a major reason why people do not trust in Christ alone to be saved. Religious pride in one's works or rituals, intellectual pride in rejecting God's plan of grace since it's contrary to human wisdom, maybe denominational pride and tradition gets in the way. You see, the gospel is a stone of stumbling, and it's a rock of offense when it comes to our human pride. But also keep in mind that humility requires not only a growing orientation to God's grace, but also a continuing orientation as it relates to the Christian life. You see, you're not only saved by grace through faith in Christ, but you live the Christian life in the very same way. God's plan for you is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about His grace from beginning to end. And that's why believers are commanded to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. And that is why as we think of God's plan for your life, as it relates to salvation, it is in three tenses or phases. First, God wants to save you from the penalty of sin that happens the moment you put your faith in Christ alone and receive the gift of salvation. You then go into stage two in which he wants to save you from the power of sin in your life and make you more and more like Jesus Christ, giving you victory over the sin nature through the power of the Holy Spirit as you learn to respond by faith day by day in anticipation of going home to be with him in glory in which you will be saved one day from the very presence of sin. You see, God desires an eternal relationship with you and has provided this totally by his grace. But it must be appropriated by faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's awesome grace. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a really good person like me. Oh no, a wretch like me. And you see, as we think of that grace, we think of Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, which is an appeal to the believer who's already been saved from the penalty and obviously isn't with the Lord in heaven. So it's dealing with second tense issues. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, a term for a believer, member of the family of God, by the mercies of God, the basis of the appeal, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, which means your life is set apart unto God acceptable to God, it's well-pleasing to Him, which is your reasonable service. You see, that word reasonable literally carries the idea of logical. You see, God's will is rational, it is relational, and it is revelational, as we'll see in a moment, as you learn the will of God through the Word of God. And thus it says, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, why do you think he says that? Because is that not our tendency? To let the world squeeze us into our 
It's mold. We could save with baggage, and we could save with worldly viewpoints, and, and then we walk in this world that's constantly encouraging us to put value in the wrong places, to view ourselves from the world's perspective, to always be wanting to, again, measure up, to be something, letting the world define us instead of the Word of God. Do not be conformed to this world. That's a command. But second command, be transformed. And notice, conformed is externally, transformed is internally. You know, this reminds me of 2 Corinthians 3.18. For as we behold Jesus Christ in the word of God, we are being changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see... The way to be transformed is by the renewing of your mind in the Word of God. You see, this is the mind of Christ. If you want to be transformed internally, you need to be occupied and exposed and embracing the mind of Christ. This is how you become Christ-like, by being occupied with the Lord and responding to Him in your own personal love relationship as the Word of God saturates your thinking, shapes your thinking, transforms your thinking with the view that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you see, God does have a will. It's good and it's acceptable and it's perfect. You see, the Christian life deals, first of all, with your understanding of God and His truth. That's the only way to grow. That's the only way to have spiritual stability in your life. And in doing so, orienting to the grace of God. You only need one glance of faith in Christ for salvation, but it will require an ongoing gaze for sanctification. Taking in, again, the Word of God. So... Let me diagram this once again for you. As we think of you, the believer, and myself, we have an external body, which people can see, and internally, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. In our soul resides our mentality, emotion, and volition. With our spirit, we have a God consciousness, but no relationship to God until we are born again. Before we are saved, we are in bondage to the sin nature, which naturally wants to put me first. In doing so, this reflects itself again in overt sins, or, or maybe nice things, human good, but they all emanate from the flesh, and therefore they are filthy rags, Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But when we hear the gospel and we put our faith in Christ, not only is our destiny changed, not only is our position changed from being in Adam to being in Christ, but our human spirit now is regenerated. We receive a new nature that now gives us desires for God we never had before. We're now connected relationally to the Lord. We receive the Holy Spirit whose desire now is to glorify Jesus Christ in our life by producing the fruit of the Spirit, or also divine good, think good works, as we saw last time in Ephesians 2.10, that are wrought of the Spirit out of gratitude to the Lord, produced by the Spirit of God as we walk in yielded dependence upon the Lord. The sin nature's right to rule in our life has been broken through the cross and our identification with Christ. And the appeal now is to believe this and to now yield to the Lord. And we recognize at any given moment we can yield to the flesh or we can yield to the Spirit of God's objective in glorifying Jesus Christ. When we yield to the flesh, we are carnal. When we yield, as it were, to the Spirit, we are spiritual. And you see, the Spirit of God now wants to take the Word of God, which is alive and powerful, and transform our thinking by impressing upon us the character or person of God. He, he wants to emphasize our position in Christ. He wants to teach us about our possessions by grace. He wants to emphasize the power 
we have in the Holy Spirit. And he wants to underscore the purpose we now have in Christ, which is to glorify the Lord and fulfill his will. And thus, the appeal that's made here in verse 1 is to present ourselves, to yield ourselves, to say in essence, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will as I remain still. Da, 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 da. By the way, do you think that way? Have you ever made a decision even to want your life to glorify the Lord and to live for him so as to yield to him? It's not a one-time shot, but it has to start sometime and somewhere, and it did in my life on July 11th, 1973, when I made a decision after I had been saved for a few months that by the grace of God, I wanted my life to count for him. I wanted to honor him. I wanted to serve him. I had no clue how to do that, but God can work with a willing heart, and he did with me and started to provide everything necessary for that to occur. You see, yielding to the Lord and walking by faith in light of your position in Christ is something, obviously, that is a daily thing, but it has to start somewhere. Now, as you do and you get oriented to grace, as he takes the word of God and he's orienting to you, to his grace, and all that that means, this is going to affect your understanding of things. This is going to affect how you view God. This is going to affect how you view yourself. This is going to affect how you view your life. It's going to change you. And that's what's wonderful about grace, is by grace, you can be changed. You can be transformed. No, the sin nature will not improve, but he will show you how to have victory over it, and he will seek to transform you internally by way of this new nature that you have in Christ. In doing so, number one, God wants you to understand your position in Christ by God's grace. This new union you have, as you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, and should we have time but we're not going to do it, we'd go back to Romans 6 and see how you've been co-crucified with Christ and co-buried with Christ and co-risen with Christ. You are a new creation in Christ. You have died to sin and alive to God. And you see, in doing so, God wants to give you, as it were, a new set of glasses. He wants you to look at yourself differently. Don't keep viewing yourself as in Adam. You're in Christ. You're a new creation in him. You're a child of God. And the fact is, I think of that, go with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. If you are discouraged tonight, if you're gagging on yourself, Think about this for a minute. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us as believers, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, loved ones, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Total transformation, glorification, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, in the meantime, purifies himself just as he is pure. Just stop and think of God's love for you. Just think about the fact that you're a child of God. By the way, that's what defines you. What describes you may be a, a, a father or a mother, a brother or a sister, a this or a that. But what defines you is you're a child of God. You belong to the Lord. And you know what? He loves you. He loved you when he saved you, and he still loves you. You say, oh, you don't know how I failed. You think he's surprised? Do you think he knew what he was getting? And you know what? He loves you anyhow. Unconditionally, he loves you. Did you deserve being given this position in Christ? No. 
Are you worthy of it? No. But God gave it to you how? On the basis of what? Grace. So do you believe it? And if you do, let him who glories, glory in the Lord. But as we continue to get oriented to grace, number two, God wants you to understand your possessions in Christ by God's grace. And go with me to Romans chapter 5. There are a number of places we could go for this, but Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Capsulize these three tenses of salvation and some of the blessings associated with them. Verse 1, therefore, having been justified in the past, God doing it on our part, by faith, that was our part, we put our trust in Christ, we have now in the present peace with God, and how was all of this possible? Through our Lord Jesus Christ taking us right back to the gospel. Through whom, Jesus Christ also, we have access by faith into this grace in which, this grace, we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You see, we have access here, and this is in the perfect tense, at a point in time in the past when we were saved, we have access by faith into this grace now, and that access remains to this very day. Everything you need has been provided. It is accessible to you. In which this grace, we stand in grace, also in the perfect tense. And we rejoice in the present, or in the meantime, in hope of one day enjoying with certainty the glory of God. So we see the past, we see the present, and we see the future. Now, did you deserve being given these possessions in Christ? Are you worthy of them? No. But God gave them to you how? By His grace. Do you believe this? Do you believe you have access every day to the grace of God and all the provisions He's provided for you? Do you stand amazed at God's grace to you? Let him that glories glory where? In the Lord. Thirdly, as you orient to the grace of God in the Christian life, God wants you to know your power in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. God wants you to know your power in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now, Romans 8 is going to talk about this, and we'll touch on that later. But keep in mind that the Christian life is a supernatural way of life, demanding a supernatural means of execution. And that means is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Ephesians 5, we pick it up for our purposes in verse 16, or verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, Carefully, wisely, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, buying up the opportunities to live for Christ because the days are evil. By the way, you know, as a believer, you can either squander your opportunities or you can redeem the time, which is true in your life. Now, to redeem the time, you're going to need to know the will of God, right? Verse 17, therefore, do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. And not only that, verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. A believer is not to be drunk with wine, or any other alcoholic beverage for that matter. Instead, he is to be filled, he's to be controlled, he's to be dominated, He's to be led along with. He's to be enabled by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a command to be filled with the Spirit in the present tense. It's something that is to be ongoing. 
You see, he does not command us to be baptized by the Spirit. Why? Because that happened at salvation. He doesn't command us to be sealed with the Spirit. Why? Because that happened at salvation. He doesn't command us to be indwelt or gifted or regenerated by the Spirit. Why? Because that happened at salvation. The filling of the Spirit is relative to our condition. It is not part of our position. But in light of having the Holy Spirit, we have available power to live the Christian life. You see, pride says, I can handle it. I can do it. Humility says, I can't. Thank God I have the Holy Spirit to enable me to live the Christian life God's way. Did you deserve being given the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, no. Were you worthy of Him? Well, no. But God gave it to you again. How? On the basis of His grace. So do you believe that? Do you believe you have the Holy Spirit in you and you have available power? What difference has the Holy Spirit made in your life this week? Have you even thought about that available power? You see, to have this resource and not appropriate it, not access it, means we're squandering the opportunity available to Fourthly, as you orient to God's grace, he not only wants you to know your position and possessions and power, but he also wants you to understand your promises in Christ, and that is grace is sufficient in every trial you face. As you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have the account where Paul was caught up into the third heavens to see things he was not permitted to utter. In doing so, we're going to see one of God's great and precious promises, which, by the way, need to be mixed with faith. You see, one of the greatest attitudes and acts of humility that you could express is to fully depend upon God day by day, decision by decision, trial by trial and, and step by step. As I think of that, look at verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Notice, the word last actually is interesting. It's a hina plus the word may, which is a negative. It's translated, unless I should be exalted above measure, and obviously God does not want this in my life. But notice, exalted above measure means to be puffed up with pride. It means to, to be puffed up with self-importance. It's to become conceited. And God doesn't want that. And so to prevent pride... By the abundance of the revelations, that's why he could have been proud. You see, the word abundance literally is the Greek word hyperbole. It speaks of surpassing greatness. He was caught up to the third heavens. He saw all of this stuff. Wow! And if you're not careful, pretty soon you got a big head. Pretty soon you say, well, God never did that to anyone else. Pretty soon you think you're a spiritual hot dog of some kind. And in order to prevent pride, he was given a thorn in the flesh. Called also here a messenger of Satan. To buffet me, not buffet me. To buffet me. To torment me. To harass me to beat on me, to trouble me. This was allowed by God to prevent pride and encourage humility. And by the way, trials can do that. They can humble us. They can keep our feet on the ground. They can bring us to our knees. They're part of the Romans 8.28 that are working together for good. Even a messenger of Satan allowed in your life can work together for good. Now this doesn't mean he was demon indwelt or inhabited or something like that. It's impossible for a believer to be indwelt by a demon, for we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that 
Satan can't use demonic forces, human viewpoint and other means in order to discourage us, or in this case, to, to just harass Paul, tormenting him each step of the way. And again, why was this allowed? Lest, here's again, Hena plus the May, lest I be exalted above measure. Two times it's mentioned here. To be puffed up with pride. Because God resists the proud. And he didn't want to resist, Paul. He doesn't want to resist you and me. He is for us. He wants to give us grace. So in this case, to keep him humble, as it were, this was allowed in his life. You know, if we're not careful, we begin to glory in our self-importance. We begin to think we're replaceable. Again, keep in mind, God buries his workmen, but he continues his work. God does not need us, though he wants to use us. But to do so, we need to be walking in humility. And so, what does Paul do in light of this? Whatever trial you're going through tonight, it may not be a messenger of Satan, obviously, but it can be another difficulty physically, relationally, medically, family-wise, financially. Do you know that God is seeking to use that to humble you and to get you dependent upon him or keep you dependent upon him? So how did Paul respond to this thorn in the flesh? Verse 8. Concerning this thing, the thorn in the flesh, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now notice the word pleaded here. That obviously isn't some perfunctory prayer. This is pleading, imploring, earnestly praying. He meant business with the Lord. And trials have a way of really bringing us to our knees so that we really earnestly pray. I pleaded with who? With the Lord. Three times. Notice he didn't talk to Satan. You know, when I hear about these people today that say, you know, they ask demons what their names are and so they can tell them where to go. You know, I just thought, I have nothing to say to any demon. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There is no offensive strategy, as it were. It's a defensive posture in which we put on the whole armor of God that we may withstand the wiles, the methods of the devil. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Is it okay to wish that a trial you're facing departs from you? Yeah. Is it okay to pray about it? Yes. Is it okay to ask the Lord to, to cause it to leave you? Yes. But his will isn't always that it would. Even in this circumstance, instead of hearing, yes, it's going to depart. Yes, I'm going to relieve you of it. The Lord's answer was, no, I'm not going to relieve you of it. But I'm going to give you the grace to deal with it. And he said to me, now watch this, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, is sufficient there? That's in the present tense. It was in the past, it will be in the future, it is right now. And by the way, he does not give you grace in advance. You know, you tend to think, man, if I was going through that trial, I don't know how I'd ever deal with it. You know what? The reason you don't know how you're going to deal with it, because you're not going through it. When you go through it, God will give you the grace then to deal with it. Not before. My grace is sufficient for you. And don't you love that he knows about you, he cares about you, his grace is sufficient for you as well? For, now notice, my grace turns to now my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's perfected. It's matured in your weakness. And you see, the thorn in the flesh exposed his weakness. The thorn in the flesh exposed the fact that he couldn't handle it. He couldn't deal with it. Lord, I need you. And the Lord is going, I know you do. I've brought you along in your understanding. You'll see. I will give you the grace to deal with this. I don't want the grace to deal with it. I want out. 
No, I'm not going to let you up. I'm going to give you the grace to deal with it because you will grow more by dealing with it than if I let you out. It kind of reminds me, remember, of Jacob? Remember he was wrestling with the Lord? And finally, you know, the Lord popped out his hip, as it were. And, you know, he limped around the rest of his life as a constant reminder, you don't wrestle with the Lord and win. And the fact that God's grace was available to him. Well, if now remember, this is Christ's reply. Here is Paul's conclusion. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmity. I'd rather rejoice. Where in my infirmities? Why? That the power of Christ. Now, that's our third term. Grace, my strength, the power of Christ may rest upon me. A little figurative speech here. It's kind of like the Shekinah glory coming down. It's the power of Christ resting upon me to give me what I need to deal with the situation. Verse 10, therefore. Here's another conclusion. I take pleasure. I rejoice is the idea. This isn't, you know, like, oh, just keep the trials coming. Yeah. You know, no, no, no. This isn't something sadistic. I take pleasure in that. No, no. The idea is I rejoice. The ESV translated, I am content. The Amplified, I am well pleased. The New American Standard, I am well content. In other words, though I'm having a thorn in the flesh, I am content with it. I am content in it. Now that is incredible because most of the time we're not content. In fact, not that men can't struggle with this, but a lot of times women struggle with contentment. He says, and I am content in infirmities, in reproaches or insults. When you get insulted, are you content? In needs, hardships, in persecutions, in distresses or difficulties. Now notice, these are for Christ's sake. These were not self-induced things that were brought on by virtue of being a jerk. This was for Christ. He was suffering this for Christ. And this thorn in the flesh was because of Christ. For when or whenever I am weak, and I sense my human weakness, then I am strong. Why? Because I'm resting in, I'm relying upon the power of Jesus Christ. By the way, are you learning this in your trial? Are you learning this in what you're going through right now? It might be an unwanted divorce and maybe a difficulty with a child. Maybe your, your son threw the toilet paper roller down the toilet today and it got clogged and it's a mess. You know, can you claim my grace is sufficient? I heard of a believer who went through that today. That's why I brought that up. And I guess the other kids went toilet after that. So that's really fun. A thorn in the flesh. <laughs> By the way, did you deserve being given these great and precious promises like my grace is sufficient for you? Well, no. Were you worthy of them? Well, no. But God gave them to you how again? On the basis of everyone? Grace. So do you know any promises? Have you are you believing the promises? Do you stand amazed at God's sufficient grace? Let him who glories glory where? In the Lord. Number five, as you continue to orient to grace, God wants you to understand that your purpose in Christ is to glorify God. And to no longer live for yourself, but for Jesus Christ, because of his great love for you. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. These believers were saved in a very decadent, degenerate culture. With sexual morality running rampant. And the sins of the culture tend to be the sins of the church. And that's why in verse 18 he tells them to flee immorality. But in verse 19 he says, or do you not know? That means God wants you to know this. 
that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who? The Holy Spirit is in you. Whom? The Holy Spirit you have from God. And that you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Now notice what he says. Number one, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You see, God dwells today not in some tabernacle in the Holy Land or some temple in Jerusalem. God the Holy Spirit dwells today in the bodies of believers. The Holy Spirit is in you if you are saved. The Holy Spirit you have been given from God. And now you're not your own. Why? You've been bought at a price. The price is the blood of Christ. He has freed you from the slave market of sin. And you, now you belong to God. You are a child of God. This again defines you. Therefore, the conclusion is, glorify God. And that's the command. That's the will of God. Glorify God where? In your body by living in sexual purity. And in your spirit in living again. In a way that honors the Lord. Because your body and your spirit are now God's. They belong to God. Are you living that way? You wake up in the morning thinking in terms that your life belongs to the Lord. That you are in Christ. His grace is sufficient. And your purpose today is to glorify Him as you walk by faith and fellowship with Him. And what motivates you again is the love of Christ. Compels us because we just thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And that He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. But now they should live for Him who died for them and rose again. I know no greater motivation. So that you could, as you're filled with the Spirit, say with the Apostle Paul, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And as I've said so many times, this verse makes no sense apart from Christ. For me to live is money, and to die means someone else gets it. For me to live is my job, and to die means I'm replaced. For me to live is my kids, and to die means I'm separated from them. See, it makes no sense, except for Jesus Christ. For to me to live is Christ and die is gain, because gain means I'm going to be with Christ, which is far better. Far better. And if your kids are saved, one day they're going to be with the Lord as well. And by the way, is there any greater concern that we should have than that our children are saved? First and foremost, and then ideally walking with the Lord and growing in the Lord, serving the Lord, though you can't make them. You can certainly seek to influence them, impact them, train them, encourage them, pray for them, and at times challenge them and even rebuke them. But they have to decide in their heart of hearts who they will serve. You know, as I think of all this grace, I think of an old classic commentary written by by William R. Newell, commentary on Romans, verse by verse. And this is what he said, and I put these quotes on your handouts so that you can take them home with you as well. There being no cause in the creature why grace should be shown, the creature must be brought off from trying to give cause to God for his grace. He has been accepted in Christ, who is his standing. He is not on probation. As to his life past, it does not exist before God. He died at the cross, and Christ is his life. Grace, once bestowed, is not withdrawn. For God knew all the human exigencies beforehand. His action was independent of them, 
not dependent upon them. In other words, he didn't bless us for what we've done. He's blessed us because of who he is and what Christ has done. Regarding the proper attitude of man under grace, Newell said, to believe and consent to be loved while unworthy is the great secret. To refuse to make resolutions and vows, for that is to trust in the flesh. To expect to be blessed though realizing more and more lack of worth. Wow. You see, as you grow in the Lord, the more you realize, I knew I was undeserving, but am I really undeserving? And yet, you know you've been blessed, and you know that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. And that it's God who's working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Furthermore, to rely on God's chastening or child training hand as a mark of his kindness. You see, when God is disciplining you, it's not because he hates you. It's not because he's angry at you. It's because he loves you and he wants you to be a partaker in a practical way of his holiness. Things which grace-oriented souls discover. Newell says, to hope to be better, hence acceptable, is to fail to see yourself in Christ only. To be disappointed with yourself is to have believed in yourself. Now this is a really good one. How many times are we just disappointed in ourselves because we thought we should have done better, right? Now this is not to in any way exclude human responsibility. But it is to recognize, friends, that I am what I am by the grace of God. That in me, that it's in my flesh, dwells no good thing. To be disappointed with yourself, oh shucks, I should have done better, is to have really believed in yourself. To be discouraged is unbelief as to God's purpose and plan and blessing for you. You discouraged tonight? I can tell you why you're discouraged. Because you're looking at your circumstances or you're looking at yourself. But you know what? God's bigger than that. He's accepted you in Christ. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. He's going to make you like his son. He wants you to be willing. And he's willing to take you right where you are and take you where he wants you to be. Now, I really like the next one. To be proud is to be blind. For we have no standing before God in ourselves. You know, when we get proud and arrogant, we're blind. Who do we think we are? Again, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you would visit him? And all that we are and all that we have is because of his grace. We have no standing before God in ourselves. We have a standing in God because of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, the lack of divine blessing therefore comes from unbelief and not from failure of devotion. Now do you understand that? You see, we think, oh, if I only could be more devoted. Now it's not that we shouldn't be more devoted, but the lack of blessing in our life by way of peace and joy and so forth comes from unbelief and not from failure of devotion. You see, to preach devotion first and blessing second is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. The law made man's blessing depend on devotion. Grace confers undeserved, unconditional blessing. Our devotion may follow, but does not always do so in proper measure. So true. Now turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 15. Because of time, I think I'm going to hold off on the rest of your handout till Sunday morning, which means I have a jump on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. But I want you to look at a verse here in closing. It's a great verse. It's a wonderful truth. And it ties in so well with what we've just been reading. Romans 15 and verse 13. Do you know this verse? 
You have it memorized? Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. I'd like to say faith resting. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the first thing I want you to focus on is the phrase God of hope. You see, he's the God of all grace, but he's also the God of hope. He has a wonderful plan for your life and a future for you. And he wants to fill you with all joy and peace. He wants your life to be filled to overflowing. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He wants to fill you with all joy and peace in believing, faith resting. You see, as you rest in the character of God, as you faith rest in your position in Christ, as you faith rest in these possessions you have, as you faith rest in his promises, as you faith rest in his power, as you faith rest in his purpose, it is amazing as you're walking by faith and you're resting in the Lord and you're allowing these truths to make a difference in your life. You're thinking about them. You're accessing them. You're meditating on them. Because they're all true. And obviously, we can't have all the truths of the Word of God we know on the launching pad of our thinking all at the same time. It just isn't going to happen. But we can focus on the Lord, and as we focus on Him, we think, I'm identified with Him. As we focus on Him, I think of, wow, what I have in Christ. As I focus on Him, I think in terms of, wow, I have available power. As I focus on Him, I think of, wow, great and precious promises. As I think of Him, I'm focused on, I have a purpose because of the love of Christ to now live for Him who died for me. And notice what it says. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In believing. That you may abound in hope. Not only have joy right now and peace right now, but abounding in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This isn't cranked out hope. This isn't cranked out joy. This isn't cranked out peace. This is what he produces in your life. As you are focused and faith resting. And you see, the Christian life always goes, comes down to focus and faith. Always. Who are you focusing on? And who are you relying on? Who are you believing? You believe in Satan's lies? You believe in the, the values and lies of the world? Or are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind? So you're focusing on the Lord. You're orienting more and more to grace. You're enjoying peace. You're enjoying joy. You're abounding in hope. Because I can see what the Lord has done for me. I can see what the Lord now can do in me. I can see what the Lord can do through me. And I know one day what the Lord will do to me. And wow, what an amazing God. In fact, as I think of that, I'd like to, to close our service in a prayer that's a song. We could have the pianist come on back up. Number 35 in your songbooks. This is a, a song of praise. This is a prayer. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Let's stand as we, as we sing together.
How can I say thank for the thing you have done for me? Thing so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me. The voice of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to Thee. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things He has done. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And should I give any praise, let it go to Calvary. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the thing he has done. Dear Father, thank you so much for blessing us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Thank you for all that we have. It is by your grace, and we are humbled because of this. And by your grace, we know we live the Christian life. So may we walk in yieldedness to you, not resisting your will. May we walk by faith in dependence upon you, believing your word, remembering your attributes, relying upon you day by day. And may indeed we recognize the great purpose we have in Christ to now live for him who died for us, knowing one day we're going home, that in the meantime you want to fill us with all joy and peace as we faith rest in Christ, that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you again for these wonderful truths. To you be the glory, great things you have done. We thank you in Jesus' name, and amen.